So glad you're with us today. Welcome to Freedom. My name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor, and my wife and I have the privilege of pastoring what I believe is the greatest church in the world. That was your opportunity to like say, yeah, that's us. Awesome. We are on this journey in this series called Finding Freedom, and it's been our heart's cry as a church to, to lead us and to see all of us step into this place of freedom. Not just talk about being free, but actually being spiritually free. And, and part of this, this journey that we're in as a church and what you need to know is that it is not just my idea or me coming up with this. My wife and I, and she's got a word to bring to you today that is going to encourage your heart, speak to spiritual things, and breathe life into you. But I just, I just need you to know that this, is, this whole series, this journey that we're on has been something that my wife and I have been talking about, praying about. We stay up at night, like, thinking about you, praying for you, like, our, our hearts are beating for you to discover what God has for you, for all of us. And one of my greatest joys in this life is to walk next to this woman and to watch her discover the things of God to watch her dig out her own heart, and to watch her push others to do the same. So church, I'm telling you today, you are in for a treat. Would you do me a favor and stand to your feet? Would you just help me honor and welcome my bride, Sunshine Vincent? Thank you, guys. You can be seated. Well, like Ryan said, we are continuing this journey today, and um, really what's going to be the longest series our church has ever done. And so, but it's something that we passionately believe in. We passionately know that this is something our church as a whole needs to go through. This curriculum, honestly, that another church down in Alabama who we deeply love and they love us, um, they created this curriculum. And right now we're taking our large groups, the men and women large groups. So if you're not in a small group, Guys, you're on Monday nights. Women, Tuesday nights. If you want to jump in, now's the time to jump in. You've got this week left to just jump right in, okay? Um, but anyway, we're taking the whole church through this curriculum because we believe it's our next step in finding freedom. And we believe it's our next step in living out the life that God has for us. And here's the deal. Today, the message, last week, Ryan talked about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And two weeks ago, we just introduced the whole concept of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And I get to talk about the tree of life. And let me tell you that out of all of the weeks, this is my absolute favorite. It didn't, I wasn't supposed to talk about this. It's just kind of worked out this way, which I was so grateful for because it's my absolute favorite thought process. It's my favorite concept because this is what I think is missing in our churches today. In Christianity today, this is the one thing that if we could just grasp this concept, if we could just root ourselves in the tree of life thinking, it would literally change everything. It would change the world around us. But as Christians, so often we get stuck in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is what Ryan talked about last week. So if you weren't here, make sure you go online and listen, or listen online or the podcast or wherever you listen. But I'm telling you, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, as we'll discover, we talked about already, it produces shame and victimization and condemnation and operating out of a sense of duty. But the tree of life is a place of freedom. It's exactly what Ryan just talked about, understanding that we get to walk out freedom. And that's what we get to talk about today. So in Genesis 2, 15 through 17, it's going to be on the screen. I missed putting on the screen the first portion of this, so I apologize. But it basically talks about how God created the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But then 15 through 17 says this. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And Ryan talked all about that last week, so I don't want to get too much involved in there. But again, you have to know that the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what that produces is that shame cycle that we talked about last week, that victimization, that condemnation, operating as a Christian even out of duty, so, yep, read my Bible today, check mark. Yep, went to church today, check mark. Yep, prayed for five minutes today, check mark. You know, so that's tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
but the tree of life truly is freedom. Ryan closed last week with this verse, and I love it because it's so true. How you read this verse, even how I read it and you hear it right now, will help you determine which tree you're living in even today. So it's John 14, 15. It says this in the Amplified Version. It says, if you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. If you're living in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it's easy to hear that verse and say, if you really love me, if you, it's God sitting like Abraham Lincoln on the chair, the, like, Ma, if you love me, right? But when I think about this verse, living in the tree of life, what it is, is it's easy. Like, hey, if you love me, you're going to keep my commands. Don't worry about that. Just focus on loving me, right? It's all about, it becomes a heart matter rather than a behavior matter. It's not about the do's and the don'ts. It's about falling more in love with who Jesus is. And if you really love him, church, you'll keep his commands. You'll be in his will. You'll walk in his ways. If you really love him, you'll discover it all. Let it unfold. When you live in the tree of life, you truly truly get to live in freedom. And so today I just want to take a couple minutes and talk about what it looks like when you live in the tree of life. So if you've got notes, take some notes today. I would encourage you, um, grab your Bible highlight. If you don't have a Bible that you like or makes sense or you don't have one at all, we always have one at the Welcome Center. And here's the thing, out of the next several weeks and months even, we want you to start bringing your Bibles to church. There is no more beautiful sound than when you hear pages flip. And just this last week, I talked to my large group and I told them, listen, even if it takes you the whole time to find the book that we're talking in, I'm okay with that. You've got to learn how to open your Bible and listen to the pages turn. You've got to learn how to read it and soak it in for yourself. And here's the deal. There's some scriptures I'm going to tell you today that are not going to be on the screen. I want you to write them down and go look them up. Don't just trust what I say. Go read it for yourself. Go discover the context for yourself. Go open up your eyes. Say, God, I don't, I don't normally read this much, but I am trusting that you're going to open my eyes to see something brand new today. Okay, so that's, that's what I want to encourage you. But if you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. It's going to be up on the screen. But real quick, we're going to talk about when you live in the tree of life. There are four things that I, or I'm sorry, three things that I think you'll automatically start doing or living, you'll see a difference. Number one is this, you operate from victory. When you live in the tree of life, you start operating from a place of victory, not for victory necessarily, but from victory. See, every day, when we sing this song just now, I am a child of God, no longer slaves, I'm like, thank you, Lord, your timing is perfect. Your timing is so perfect and so good because here's the deal. When you operate from victory, you start to have a mindset of understanding who you are. You are a child of God, okay? You are a child of God. You walk with him daily because Jesus died on the cross for us to have access to God. And so in that way, you are a child of God. You are no longer slaves. You're no longer slaves to the things of your past. You're no longer slaves to the things for your future. You know, one of my biggest frustrations in my life, I gotta be honest, is that I believe as a child of God, God has given me so many dreams and so many desires about so many different things. And deep down in the core of who I am, I'm an entrepreneur. Deep down, I've got all these business ideas and I've got all these things that I know can just change the world. But I spend so much of my time frustrated, feeling stuck, feeling like there's this major ocean in front of me and I can't get through it. And thank you, Lord, that when Ashley spoke and said today, whatever is in front of you, that doesn't just mean your past or your circumstances or the thing you can't break through or the sin. What it means is even the dreams God's put inside of your heart, you are a child of God. He will open up doors for you. When you start to operate and live in a place from victory, knowing where you stand and where where you come from, it changes everything. His blood flows through my veins. Now, my biological dad, yeah, his blood flows through my veins, 
But now I am a child of God. So I am an heir to the throne of God. I don't know about you, but that gets me really excited. That gets me in a place that I can start living a little bit differently. I don't have to think about the past. I don't even have to get overwhelmed by the dreams that God himself has put in my heart. It's a matter of walking daily with him, with a place from victory. See, the battle's already been won. Like I said, read your Bible, go to the end. You'll see that the enemy has already been defeated. And so when you start to recognize that, when you start to walk with some authority behind you, understanding who you are and whose you are, all of a sudden you will, you will start living in the tree of life because you're gonna be living from a place of victory. And I don't know, I don't know if you've ever ran into some Christians who it's almost like they think this thought process is arrogant, but I'm like, I'm sorry because I know whose I am. And so I just walk around talking like I know who I, know who I am. And that doesn't phase me. It doesn't make me frustrated. It doesn't anything. I'm just like, well, I, I'm sorry. I want you to grasp whose you are also, but I'm already starting to understand. His blood flows through my veins. I am a child of God. And so are you. And so are you. So number one, you operate from victory. You have already won. Number two is this, you operate from a place of worthiness. You operate from a place of worthiness. Here's the funny thing. I've met some Christians too, and I, I'm like, bless your heart, because you know they're living the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they don't, they don't know that. I usually come out and kind of just like teach them and tell them, but here's the deal. Have you ever ran into those Christians where they're like, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, I think, womp, womp. Like, they're like the Eeyore Christians. I'm like, come on, you've been saved by grace. Like, this is so exciting. Here's the deal. Because you have his blood flowing through your veins, you are not, quote unquote, just a sinner saved by grace. No, you have been justified with Christ. You have been made righteous in his sight. You get to sit next to God Jesus, at the throne, when you go to heaven, here's the deal. You're not just some lowly sinner saved by grace. You are the righteousness of God. People, come on. If you can get this and start operating from a place of worthiness, you are worthy of love. You are wired for struggle. I read that in a book this year, and I'm like, yes, Lord, you are wired for struggle, but you are worthy of love. And God loved you so much. You were so worthy of that love that he sent his only son to die on a cross for you, to pay the price for your sins. You don't have to walk around some lowly sinner saved by grace. You get to walk around like a person of worthiness that you have been crowned with righteousness. It changes everything when you start to live from the tree of life. The other thing about the worthiness concept is you start to understand, I am a son or a daughter of God. I'm not just some slave or servant of his. And I don't know about you, but I love, I have three kids and I love our 10 year old man. She is like the social butterfly of the century. And I feel like every weekend she's like, can all my friends come over? And I'm like, yes, most of the time, not this weekend, but every other weekend I'm like, yeah, 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 they can. Okay. What's so cool to me is the friends she has who have been to my house so much and know how we operate. You know what? They don't even, it's not rude to me when they come in and just start whipping open my fridge and get my cabinets. I'm like, you know where all the stuff is? Do your thing, you know? Like, but when people come timid into my house and they start like, oh, excuse me, can I have a drink? I'm like, oh, you don't know who you are and you don't know where you are. Because let me tell you, in my house, you operate from a place of worthiness. You operate like you're a son or daughter in this house. And I don't know about your sons or daughters, but when my sons or daughters come to my house, they get to open the fridge. They get to lounge on the couch. They get to just be free to be who they are. They get to operate in that freedom and out of that place of worthiness. And I'm telling you guys, this is how God wants us to interact with him. You are a son or a daughter of the living king. King, all right? You're not a slave. You're not that anymore. You're not a slave to your past. You're not a slave to your future. You are a son or a daughter. You get to operate from a place of worthiness. And number three is this. When you live in the tree of life, you receive what Jesus did. You receive it. 
Here's the thing, in Romans 5.8, it says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were still sinners, while we were in the midst of our sin, while we were apart from him, he died for us in that moment, in that season. He, he already did it. He already died for us. He's already paid. All you have to do is receive it. You receive it. And I've been thinking a lot. I don't know about you, but I'm a terrible gift receiver. Oh my word, I'm a nightmare. Like I literally hate receiving gifts. It's so awkward to me when somebody's like, I got you something. I'm like, huh, you did? And I like run away. Like I can't handle it. I just don't like receiving gifts. I am not good at it. Ryan tries to be super romantic all the time. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just the worst. I'll just put it out there. I am terrible at receiving gifts, okay? I'm equally terrible at receiving compliments. Like when someone's like, hey, I thought that, I'm like, don't even, just don't don't finish the sentence in Jesus' name. Like, get behind me, Satan. Like, I know. And they're like, I'm trying to tell you something nice. It doesn't matter. Like, I am just terrible at receiving anything. Like, I'm just not good at it. I got to be honest. Like, the, Jesus is working in my heart, but I'm just not good at it. But one thing that I have learned to receive is the gift of grace that God has given me. And it took me a very long time to get apart from the tree of knowledge of an evil, thinking like, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. To now a place of maturity, understanding, you know what? I don't deserve it, but he did it. And now I receive it anyway. And so I now understand receiving who he says that I am, receiving what he says about me, receiving the gifts that he gives me and operating from a place of just receiving what he's already done. You cannot earn it. I don't know about you, but when people give you gifts, you're like, hey, I'll pay you for that. I'll give you 20 bucks for that. Like, they're trying to give you a gift. That's what I do. So try to give me a gift because I'm gonna be like, you know what, I'll just pay you for it. It's fine. <laughs> like, I'll just pull it out of savings. No big deal. I'll just pay for it. But it's a gift. I don't do gifts. It's no big deal. But understanding you cannot pay for what he did for you. You just simply have to receive it. And it's so much harder. This is the, obviously, this is the one I struggle with. So I would challenge you, what is your approach to God? Are you living in the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Or so far can you see if you're living in the tree of life? And I will be truthful to tell you that sometimes people swing back and forth. So it's almost like, oh, well, today I'm feeling good, so I'm living in the tree of life. But tomorrow, when someone says something to me, man, I'm leaving the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, here's the deal. Now that you're going to start knowing what it looks like to live in the tree of life, you'll start to understand it is a choice to reside there. It is your choice that you get to reside there. So if you understand the tree of life. And if you understand what it looks like when you live in the tree of life, I will be honest with you and tell you that it takes an extreme level of faith to live there. It, it takes, it's almost like, I love when the Bible talks about when Jesus says that it's childlike innocence. That's the kind of faith that it takes to live in the tree of life. It's an, it's, it's a reckless love trusting. It's an understanding that he has what's best for me. And I have to trust him in that. My kids are in this phase, Eleanor, she's three. And man, she has, the three-year-olds are always my favorite. I, I've been through a lot of ages up until 10 now. And so far, threes are my absolute favorite because they are innocent and there is no filter whatsoever. Man, they will say whatever comes to their mind. They will run around the house you know, all the things, like they just do not care. There's just extreme innocence inside of them. And God wants that innocence from us. He wants us to be childlike in our faith. There is expectation to grow and mature, but in regards to how we approach him and our faith, always childlike, always with that innocence, always with that understanding that he has what's best for us. So like I said, you know, it is, it is a thing where people sometimes they'll start off in the tree of life and then they swing over to the tree of knowledge of good and evil or vice versa. And so I want to leave you with how do we stay in the tree of life? Because that's the goal. And I will tell you that this sets us up for the next how many ever months and honestly, till the day we die. This sets us up for everything from here on out. So how do we stay there? How do we live in the tree of life? Number one is this recognize that you are anointed by the Holy Spirit. 
And I will be honest and say that I think that the church has done not that great of a job representing who the Holy Spirit is. We've made him way more confusing than he really is. We've made him difficult to understand. We've called him an it versus a him, or we've, we've put him in this box. But the Holy Spirit wants to come. Jesus said that he had to go away. He had to die so that he could send his spirit to live with us and walk with us. He gives us discernment and knowledge and understanding and all of those things. But he also anoints us, which means that he empowers us to do the work that God has asked us to do. He empowers us to understand the Bible. He empowers us to go out and live a life that would honor God. We need the Holy Spirit, and you are anointed of the Holy Spirit. You are anointed. Maybe no one's ever said that to you before. Maybe you thought that was just for some preacher and his wife, but you are anointed by the Holy Spirit. We're going to get more into the Holy Spirit in a couple weeks, but for right now, you are anointed. So that's how you stay in the tree of life. Number one, you have to recognize that anointing that's on your life. You have to recognize that Jesus sent him as a gift for us, the Holy Spirit. And you have to recognize that he wants to walk with you and give you discernment and give you understanding and help you to understand what it is that you're supposed to be doing on this earth while you're here. So number two is this, and I want to camp here for a minute, but you need to stay madly in love with Jesus How do you live in the tree of life and how do you stay there? You need to stay madly in love with Jesus. And maybe for the first time, you need to fall madly in love with Jesus. Because here's the thing. In our world, it's so easy to walk around and try to avoid sin like crazy, right? Like we're walking around trying to exercise some willpower that's inside of us. We're trying to say like, I don't want that. Okay, I don't want that. Like it's anyone who's been on a diet. (laughs) Okay, hello. I can't have the donut. It's sitting there. Oh man, it looks good. I can't have the donut. Hey, donut. (laughs) Boy, you look glossy. Oh, you're, you're nice. I can tell you're soft, donut. Oh, I can't have you. Like, we start focusing so much on the donut that what do we do? Hello, donut, Titus. You're going straight in my mouth. What diet? I don't even know what diet you're talking about. I don't even know what the word diet means, right? Like, all of a sudden, we have gone from like, whoa, I'm on a health journey diet to like, oh, sin, Titus. Don't tell Titus I said that. But I'm just saying, like, this is what we do. We get so focused on avoiding the thing right? That we stop focusing on what it is we're trying to accomplish. And so if we stay madly in love with Jesus, it's easy to run away from the things that aren't supposed to be in our life. If we stay madly in love, I think about it like this, Ryan is constantly pursuing me and I'm trying to constantly pursue him. If we would just stay madly in love with each other, you know how easy it is for us to just keep going and growing and moving together in the right direction? And it's so much harder harder for any temptation to come against us because we're just so set on pursuing each other that nobody else in this world has any kind of place with us, right? So it's the same thing. So if I'm madly in love with who Jesus is, not only for what he's done for me, but simply because of who he is, it's easier for me to flee from evil like the Bible tells me. I almost don't even have to think about it because I'm so focused on running towards and falling madly in love with Jesus that I'm not even fixated on fleeing from evil, okay? This is how you stay. This is how you live in the tree of life. Stay madly in love with him. Philippians 4, 8, it's not on the screen, but it just reminds us whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, think about those things. Don't start constantly thinking about don't have the donut or avoid the sin. Don't go to the addiction. Don't do this. Don't do that. No, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is right, whatever is noble, think about, ponder on these things. You guys fall madly or stay madly in love with Jesus. Number three is this. Surround yourself with people who understand grace and mercy. Just surround yourself with them. If that means you got to cut off some friends, so be it. So be it. But surround yourself. This is how you live in the tree of life. Surround yourself 
with people who understand this. It changes everything. It changes literally everything. There's a story in the Bible in John where it talks about this woman who was caught in the act, in the middle of the act of adultery. She was literally caught in the act of adultery. And Pharisees, men came and got her and threw her before Jesus. And so there she has all these people saying like, oh, let me just tell you, Jesus, what she just did. She was caught in the act of adultery. And what they were doing was two things. One, they were trying to expose her sin, but they were also testing Jesus because here he's walking around preaching grace and truth and mercy and all of that. But this woman was caught in the act. And according to the laws, she should have been stoned to death. She literally, right in the center of the public street, should have had rocks thrown at her, stoned to death for what she had done. And so the men came and told Jesus, and one, I'm like, how did you even know she was there? Don't get me started on that. Number two, here's the deal. Jesus, in his wisdom and amazingness, was like, okay, you're right. That is what the law says. But, but, whoever has no sin, let that person throw the first stone. And he knelt down, and nobody knows what he wrote in the sand. Scholars have tried to predict, but nobody knows what he wrote in the sand. But he wrote in the sand. He wrote in the dirt right there. And as he look up, one by one, they're leaving. One by one. I don't know if you've ever had grace given to you in that way or recognize the grace that has been given to you in that way. But it changes everything. It changes everything. When God gives us things we don't deserve and when the mercy comes, when he withholds what we do deserve, it literally changes everything. But the thing I love most about that story is that at the very end, all the accusers are gone. Jesus stands back up and he looks at her and he says, daughter, where are your accusers? They've left. Now go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Now, if you're living in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you hear that as you're a sinner, don't do this ever again. But if you're living in the tree of life, you hear, I love you so much. And this isn't the best for you. So please go, leave this life. Don't do this anymore. It's not what I have in store for you. And grace and mercy just flood in and heal her heart. And we don't hear about that happening again. Here's the thing. Go and sin no more. If you're looking at it from a tree of life, what is it in your life that if Jesus were right there, because he is, but if he were right there, what would your accusers have to say about you? And where can he meet you with his grace flood? Expose that part of your life to him. Let it just sit out in the middle of the public square with just you and him. And then let him just love you through that. There's a verse that says, it says this, it says, um, now, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And here's the thing that I'm starting to learn more and more and more and more is we get condemnation and conviction completely mixed up. Conviction, man, welcome conviction and correction. Welcome it. Beg God for it. Like, God, show me. Convict my heart. He will never condemn you but he wants to convict you so that, again, if you're in the tree of life, so that you can live out the life he has for you. But if you're in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're like, oh, he just wants to Abraham Lincoln, point fingers in my face. Like, no, that's not what that's about. But what I'm learning even more, especially in the last couple of months, something that's very fresh in my heart, is that verse, therefore there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, or from those who are in Christ Jesus. And so I can tell when I'm starting to live in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, when I start in my mind condemning everyone around me. When I'm like, oh, well, they're, blah, 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 blah. I can't even finish that sentence. Blah, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. whatever. 
But when I'm like coming alongside of them and picking their face up off the dirt with tears in their eyes, and I'm like, listen, go and sin no more. Man, that's me coming alongside someone and saying, listen, you are a daughter of the king. This is not what's best for you. That's not us condemning each other. That's us growing together. And there's such a difference. Get around people. Surround yourself with people who get this. That's why small groups are great. And you know I was going to go there. And I know you know I was going to go there. But if you're not in a small group, I need you to get in one. Because you need this in your life. You need women. You need other women. I know you don't think you do, but you do. You need them. Men? Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> So surround yourself with people who understand grace and mercy. Number four is this. Number four is this. Salvation starts with surrender. Salvation starts with surrender. So how do you stay in the tree of life? You continue that heart of surrender. Man, I can tell the minute I'm trying to take control from God. I can tell. I am so good at justifying anything that I want to happen. I am so good at this. This is like what I do. Okay. Remember the donut story? Ha. Huh. That's okay. I'll just work out for an hour. Like, no, like, no. So here's the deal. I can tell when I start to try to take back control from God. I can tell when I'm trying to manipulate a situation to work out for my benefit. I can tell. You know why? Because I'm anointed of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit convicts me and he points it out. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I did that again. Okay. I'm done. So if you're in that situation where you're continually manipulating or trying to coax out the things, even if it's a good thing, even if it's the dream God's put in your heart and you're not operating out of a place of surrender, I'm telling you that's one of the fastest ways that you will come out of the tree of life. And so if you just say, okay, God, today I surrender my heart to you. God, surrender my dreams to you. God, I surrender all that I am to you. I surrender my family. Okay, God, like keep me in this place of total surrender. It changes everything. It allows you to stay in the tree of life. It allows you to stay there. And number five is this. It's just simply choose life. Choose life. Deuteronomy 30, 19 through 20 says this. It says, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See you guys, this is the thing. This is so much more than a mindset. This is not about me being an, um, an optimist. This is about a choice that I make daily, every day. Sometimes it's hour by hour. I don't even make it for the whole day. It's, am I going to live in the tree of life? Am I going to choose life today? Or am I going to live in the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And when you don't know which tree you're living in, just ask your best friend, they'll tell you. And if you don't have a best friend, previous point, get in a small group, like find a best friend, but they'll tell you. The, it, it, it's honestly, it's not that hard to see especially when you've been exposed to and lived in the freedom of the tree of life. If you don't know which one you're in, just ask your best friend, like, hey, am I demonstrating the fruit of living in the tree of life? Or am I demonstrating the fruit of living in the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Which one am I in? But it's more than a mindset, you guys. This is actually a choice. And at the end of the day, when I tell you to read your Bible, if you're from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're hearing, bring your Bible to church. If you don't bring your Bible, blah, blah, blah. Like, but if you're in the tree of life, I'm like, hey guys, I don't want you to just read about Jesus. I want you to experience him. I want you to know him. I don't wanna just read about my husband, man. I wanna go to coffee with him. I wanna hear his dreams. I wanna hear his thoughts. I wanna know what's happening inside of his heart. That's the same with Jesus. I don't wanna just read about him on the page. I wanna know him. So I spend time with him and I read about him and I encounter him. I wanna know who he is. Some of you are sitting there and you're like, but I can't possibly come to the tree of life because you're living in a mindset that God's somehow mad at you. He is not mad at you. He is madly in love with you. Hear me today. I don't know who it was or who this is for, but God is not mad at you. 
He is madly in love with you. He wants to meet you where you are, even in the center of your accusers. He wants to meet you there. And who knows that in the sand or in the dirt, he wasn't writing, I love you. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. He is madly in love with you. And for me, when I just think of who he is and what he's done for me, I can't help but fall madly in love with him. I just can't help it because I know me and I know where I've come from and I know what circumstances were around my life, but I also know that he split the sea so that I could walk right through it. He did that not only for me and my benefit, but for his glory so that thousands and thousands of years later, people would still be talking about that single victory. When I think of who he is and what he has done, man, I just can't help but fall more in love with who he is. I just can't help it. The last verse is this, and I purposely did not put this one on the screen because I want to read this over you and I want you to really hear it so that you can decide for yourself which tree are you living in. And if you're living in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, remember I said it's just simply a choice. That's it. It's a choice. And this comes even after salvation. So even after you've prayed and you said, Jesus, come to my heart. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Even as Christians, we still, man, we get stuck in that choice. We're like, am I going to live in the tree of knowledge of good and evil? This isn't about evil or good. Like that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So this isn't about like good or bad. This is about what, what, how are you going to approach God? Which version of this are you going to choose? And this is going to set you up literally one, the rest of the series, but two, the rest of your life. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says it this way. Just listen to me, you guys, like really hear this verse. This is the message paraphrase. It says this, are you tired Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. That's what he has for you. That is the life that God desires for you. So remember, it's not just about avoiding sin. It's about falling more in love with who he is. It's about choosing that. Some of us, we're tired and we're worn out and we're burned out on religion because someone else has put something on us. Probably that like, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Like either that person or something that we've, we've construed in our own minds about who God is. But it says, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover. You will recover your life. He will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. This is Jesus talking. And he will teach you the unforced rhythms of grace. And this is important. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. So if you're feeling like something's heavy, that's not of him. If it's ill-fitting, not of him. But it says, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. All across this place, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I just believe that this message was for someone today. This was not in vain. But before we even get to that place of choosing living in the tree of knowledge of good and evil or living in the tree of life, we have to choose Jesus. 
Because remember, He already paid the price. He already did it. You just have to receive what He already did. And that's what this moment is about. This moment is just sitting back and saying, okay, God, I receive what you already did. I receive it. And then just come into my heart, be the savior of my past and the Lord of my future. That is what this moment is about. So if you're in this place and you're like, sunshine, that's me. I just need to choose Jesus before I move on to those other choices. I'm just gonna count to three and we're not gonna do anything embarrassing. I'm not gonna call you up or anything like that. But right there in your seat, God will meet you right there in your seat. So if that's you and you wanna, you want me to pray with you and the rest of us to pray with you, I just want you to slip up your hand right in your seat right now. Say, sunshine, that's me. I'm ready to receive what he has already done for me. One, two, three. All right, awesome. All right, guys, we're gonna pray this out all together. Say, God, thank you for what you already did for me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross. Help me to receive what he has already done. I pray that you would be the savior of my past and the Lord of my future. And from this day forward, help me to live in the tree of life. In Jesus' name.